Introduction On July 17, 1979, the Nicaraguan Revolution successfully overthrew the Somoza regime, a brutal U.S.-backed dictatorship that had ruled the impoverished country for four decades. This victory represented the hopes of the millions of working-class Nicaraguans and peasants who, despite the country's immense material wealth, lived in destitution. Though the victory of the Nicaraguan Revolution was short-lived, in its brief time in power, it managed to give poor Nicaraguans access to health care, food, and education for the first time in their lives. How did the Somoza regime fall? How did the Nicaraguan Revolution win? And where is Nicaragua now? These are all important questions whose answers can serve as learning experiences for today's socialists and communists. Historical Context The Nicaraguan Revolution of 1979 is deeply tied to the historical context of Nicaragua itself. Nicaragua, for most of its history, has been a sparsely inhabited and impoverished peasant backwater that's been used to enrich its merchant and landowning classes. This has been mainly done through its abundant natural resources from timber, minerals, and vast agricultural lands. Nicaragua was first colonized by the Spanish in 1522. The Spanish's presence would have a disastrous effect on the natives of Nicaragua, reducing its population of a million to the tens of thousands within a couple decades through war, disease, and slavery. As Nicaragua developed, it ultimately would form two branches of the bourgeoisie, the conservative landowners headquartered in the city of Managua and the liberal merchant classes of the capital city of Leon. After gaining independence from the Spanish in 1838, the two rival branches of the Nicaraguan bourgeoisie would enter into a fierce battle for control of the country. This fierce battle between the conservatives and liberals of Nicaragua would see Nicaragua successively go in and out of liberal and conservative dictatorships, always with American interference. In 1909, America would overthrow the liberal Cela dictatorship of Nicaragua for its own conservative one, leading to a massive backlash to the puppet regime by the liberal political figure Benjamin Celedon who would lead the Celedon Rebellion in 1912. Why America was involved in Nicaragua was described perfectly by a political observer in 1912. As he said about the conservative American-backed government and the backlash to the rebellion, quote, the United States could hardly permit the overthrow of the conservative authorities. If the rebels won, all of the efforts of the State Department to place Nicaragua on her feet politically and financially would have been useless, and the interests of New York bankers would be seriously imperiled. Ultimately, America would crush the Celedon Rebellion by sending in Nicaraguan and American troops to do the job. Benjamin Celedon, the leader of the rebellion, would be captured, hanged, and have his body dragged through the streets by troops. As people gathered around the body to look on, one observer, a young boy named Augusto Sandino, would be enraged by the sight of Celedon's body and would go on to fight the people who had killed Celedon. Sandino fights back. From 1912 to 1932, Nicaragua would be directly ruled by the United States through various puppet regimes and stationed troops. During this occupation, massive amounts of control over the Nicaraguan economy would be put under American hands. Along with that, America would get the exclusive rights to build a canal in Nicaragua, military bases, and control a few islands. America in the 1920s created a military force of Nicaraguans called the National Guard, a group that would go on to become one of the most hated institutions amongst Nicaraguans. However, this occupation would not go unchallenged, as Augusto Sandino would lead a struggle against the American occupiers. Augusto Sandino was a half-Indian liberal who had been deeply inspired by the Mexican Revolution. Having worked in Mexico, he had been exposed to the trade unionist movements for the first time in his life and had become sympathetic to them, and for most of his life, he would be an anti-imperialist nationalist. In 1926, Sandino gathered a small army of 30 men and 45 sympathizers and lent them arms to fight in a guerrilla-style war against the occupiers in support of Juan Sacasas' claim to the presidency. Though the American troops and National Guard 
both militarily and technologically were much better off. By utilizing his intimate knowledge of the terrain, Sandino was able to put up a bitter fight. The battle between Sandino and Americans turned Nicaragua into a Vietnam-style war. Throughout the war, America would strategically target peasant villages and innocent civilians, causing many to become sympathetic to Sandino's fight and join his army. As this brutal war continued and American marine casualties kept going up, an anti-war movement at home grew. On January 21st, 1933, America was finally forced to admit defeat and withdrew from Nicaragua. However, in its place, it left behind the National Guard. Sandino's Fatal Mistake, the Beginnings of the Somoza Regime As America admitted defeat, peace negotiations began being discussed. America appointed Anastaiso Somoza, a liberal American educated politician, as the head of the Nicaragua National Guard. Augusto Sandino, in the ensuing peace talks, made the fatal mistake of disarming his soldiers, a miscalculation that eventually led him to being assassinated on February 21st, 1934, by Somoza's National Guard, during what were supposed to be peace talks. Though Augusto Sandino died in 1934, his legacy of guerrilla warfare and anti-imperialism would go on to influence the Nicaraguan Sandinistas decades later. With Sandino out of the way, Anastaiso Somoza set about immediately towards gaining power through killing men, women, and children in an autonomous region, and in 1936, Anastaiso Somoza would successfully overthrow the Nicaraguan government and establish a dictatorship that would last for four decades. In order to stabilize his power, Somoza implemented a number of policies, the first of these was encouraging corruption in the National Guard and allowing them to be run like a mafia which kept them loyal to Somoza. Along with that, he voted for and got support and recognition from America. Nicaragua and Somoza would become a vital pillar of regional control for the United States in Latin America. Along with that, the Somoza regime was given plenty of military and financial support by America. Finally, Somoza allowed some freedoms for the well-to-do of Nicaragua. Ultimately, under Anastasio Somoza, the economy of Nicaragua would be turned into an export economy, which, despite the massive poverty of the masses, would accumulate the Somoza family $900 million by the time the Sandinistas overthrew the regime in 1979. Essentially, under Somoza, Nicaragua was turned into a raw materials supplier to America at the expense of its own citizens, the majority of whom lived without health care, without education, and only an average of $200 to their name. Anastasio Somoza meets his end. Anastasio Somoza would ultimately be assassinated on September 20th, 1956 by progressive poet Rigoberto López Pérez. In Anastasio Somoza's absence, the rule of Nicaragua passed onto his son, Luis Somoza. However, unlike his father, Luis's rule would be drastically different. Ultimately, Luis Somoza ruled through the illusion of a democracy, maintaining power through various elected presidents who served as his puppets. Thus, though Nicaraguans could vote, no matter who they picked, the country would still be ruled by the Somoza regime. During the late 1950s and early 1960s, a fall in the prices of cotton, which was a major industry for Nicaragua, combined with unemployment and peasants being thrown off their land, would all combine to make the 1960s an era of protest for Nicaragua. Protests that were not well received by the regime. On July 23, 1959, Nicaragua would be rocked by the Leon Massacre, in which the National Guard attacked and killed four unarmed student protesters. This one event would radicalize a whole generation of students, moving them away from liberal and conservative approaches of opposing the Somoza regime towards more radical strategies. The Foundation of the FSLN and Activities in the 1960s in July of 1961, in the capital of Honduras, three former university students by the names of Carlos Fonseca Amador, Tomas Borges, 
and Silvio Mayorga would all meet to form the FSLN. The FSLN was inspired by Agosto Sandino, the National Liberation Front from Algeria, and the Cuban Revolution. The organization would ultimately represent a split with the Nicaraguan Communist Party, as the FSLN believed in guerrilla warfare and armed struggle, something that the Nicaraguan Communist Party regarded as adventurous. The FSLN's members would come to call themselves the Sandinistas in the vein of Augusto Sandino. The FSLN would be active throughout the 1960s, with it even receiving training in guerrilla warfare from Che Guevara himself and attempting a failed guerrilla operation in the remote area to the northeast of Matagalpa in 1963. Ultimately, the FSLN throughout the majority of the 1960s would remain a small fringe group without much support and would struggle and experiment with tactics of organization. With the death of Luis Somoza from a heart attack on May 1st, 1967, his brother named Anastasio Somoza, like their father, took charge of the new government and immediately initiated a bloody suppression of protests, ending the liberal facade of the Somoza dictatorship. Anastasio Somoza acted much like his father, who he shared a name with, as under him the National Guard was incentivized to be corrupt and to exploit. Along with this, the government was used to enrich both the Somoza family and its loyal lackeys. However, it would be this very mismanagement and abuse of power that would eventually lead the Somoza regime to its downfall. Failed guerrilla campaign in Pascan. In one of their earliest campaigns, the FSLN decided to organize and wage guerrilla warfare in Pascan, an extremely poor and rural region of Nicaragua without access to health care or education. However, there were many problems with the operation. Firstly, the guerrillas were criminally undermanned, with them only having 40 recruits with them. Secondly, and completely unknown to the guerrillas, the Somoza regime had recruited peasants into the National Guard, making even the peasants disloyal to the Sandinistas. Ultimately, the Bascan guerrilla operation would turn out to be a failure, being crushed by the National Guard within a few months and leading to the deaths of major leaders. After the failure of the Bascan operation, the FSLN underwent a process of debate about future organizing techniques that would divide the party amongst those who wanted to continue guerrilla warfare and those who wanted to abandon it for student organizing. The failure of the Bascan campaign in 1967 would ultimately coincide with the crushing of several guerrilla movements in Latin America and the death of Che Guevara. Turn towards underground organizing. Throughout the 1960s, the FSLN remained a small fringe party as it continued to get members from student organizers. The defeat at Pascan would turn the FSLN strategy away from guerrilla organizing in the rural parts of Nicaragua towards an urban-based underground strategy. This would be done through a network of safe houses where Sandinistas were able to relax, organize, write party papers, train, and heal wounds sustained in fighting. Families that operated the safe houses and were caught would have the whole family unit, including children, arrested by the National Guard. Though the women of the FSLN were given traditional roles, like doing chores in the safe houses, they were also treated equally within the military, with them being given weapons and being trained for action, something that was radically feminist in the patriarchal society of Nicaragua. Of course, safe houses were not always safe, as throughout the 1960s, the National Guard would track down safe houses through Nicaragua and kill whoever they could find in them. El program El Programa Histórico is passed. In 1969, major leaders of the FSLN would meet in Costa Rica in order to adopt El Programa Histórico. El Programa Histórico was overall an analysis on why Nicaragua needed revolution and how current opposition groups to the Somoza regime were not adequate enough. One major line of El Programa Histórico read that Nicaragua was a neo-colony of America and that, quote, the sector of capitalists who call themselves oppositionists 
had imposed a backward and lopsided economic system on the country, exploiting and victimizing workers and peasants, unquote. El Programa Histórico, also called for the Nicaraguan people to organize around 13 basic demands, amongst which included redistribution of the land to the peasantry, abolition of the hated National Guard, ending discrimination and sexism, and solidarity with anti-imperialist struggles all over the world. Imprisoned in the 1970s the late 1960s and early 1970s saw many raids of communist. There are detailed descriptions kept by the Somoza regime of supposed communist hideouts being filled with gunfire only for the authorities to find a single teenage body riddled with bullets inside. This increased reliance on aggressive tactics would lose Anastaiso's support from many of his civilian power base, but would not stop him from imprisoning many of the FSLN. In prison, FSLN members suffered a wide array of abuses, including electric shocks, sexual torture, and frequent beatings. Female prisoners also endured rape and were forced into prostitution. The tortures only increased with every successful FSLN operation. During their time in prison, FSLN members would detail their experiences through testimonies, drawings, and poetry and smuggled in cigarette boxes, other small scraps of paper. This new, quote, revolutionary literature, unquote, helped to spark protests in parts of the public, such as the student movement, and won them support with the indigenous population, who had also experienced this awful treatment for many years. Party membership soared with combating this human rights issue, becoming a core part of the movement. You just split the party. In the midst of the incarcerations, the FSLN as a whole began to experience a fracturing of ideological solidarity. The political climate of the early 1970s saw a shift in attitudes of Cuba, where many FSLN members lived in exile. The electoral victory of Allende in Chile had many questioning whether elections offered a more viable route towards socialism in South America. Cuba refused to provide military training to the FSLN from 1970 to 1973. This, combined with the geographic distance and communication difficulties with members back in Nicaragua, led to three different tendencies within the FSLN's ideology. Leaders still in Nicaragua followed the tendency of the prolonged People's War. They steadfastly focused on the peasants and the need for guerrilla warfare. The second tendency was led mostly by Jamie Wheelock Roman, based in Chile and then Havana after 1973. This, the proletarian tendency, would claim that the peasantry had already become proletariat and required unions rather than land reform. They were criticized by Fonseca for focusing too much on politics than on revolutionary action. The insurrectionist tendency, though, was criticized for the exact opposite. Humberto Ortega Saavedra was the leader of this third tendency that advocated bombing of economic targets and the, quote, liquidation, unquote, of prominent political targets. This factionalization did lead to heavy discussions between leadership, but ultimately did not cause a break in the party. When looking at other leftist groups of South America, it is odd that this fracturing did not follow the same path of so many older organizations. Many in other countries fell victim to the same tendency, but due to the FSLN's smaller size and the lack of a Nicaraguan socialist culture, the party leaders were able to keep the divisions between themselves. Lower members followed the tendencies of their local leaders or recruiters, but letters documenting these members' experiences reveal that they had no knowledge of the different thoughts of leadership. Earthquake Shakes the Somoza Regime on December 23, 1972, a magnitude 6.3 earthquake ripped through the capital city of Nicaragua, Managua. About 10,000 of the city's 400,000 residents were killed. Property damage by the earthquake has been estimated at over $500 million. 
600 blocks of the city were leveled. 300,000 people left homeless. What was the response of the Somoza regime to this disaster? Their diplomats called for foreign aid and pledged support for their people while enriching themselves. The Manakwa earthquake and the regime's mishandling of it was a powerful catalyst for the eventual destruction of the regime. After the earthquake and after images of the destruction were spread, the international community opened their wallets and gave large sums of money to Nicaragua. While this aid was mostly well-intentioned, it was not directed to those who needed it. Instead, the checks were cashed right into the pockets of the Somoza regime. Somoza used these relief funds to enrich himself at the expense of his people, who were dying in the streets. Where physical goods were given in place of funds, the regime allowed the National Guard to requisition and sell off these relief materials for their own profit. Even worse, the National Guard was allowed to loot the devastation in Manahua, stealing from the most vulnerable for their own gain. The people of Manahua, beaten and battered by the heaving of the earth and abandoned by the regime, were left in the cold. With no sign of relief, the people began to organize and agitate. Launching strikes, the people desperately demanded for their voices to be heard. Even among the Nicaraguan bourgeoisie, support for the Samosa regime was drying up. Before long, many of the entrepreneurial youth started to support the FSLN. Most importantly, this support included financial support. The bourgeois youth started to fund the FSLN. Tensions begin to heat up. Over the next two years, tensions rose, but slowly. It was not until December 1974 that the tensions flared up. The precipitating event was a raid conducted by the FSLN on the home of Jose Castillo, a businessman and close friend of the Somoza regime. In the raid, the FSLN took Somoza's brother-in-law and Minister of Defense as hostages. These hostages were used by the FSLN to negotiate with the regime for concessions. They fiercely negotiated for the payment of a large ransom, the publication and broadcast over national radio of a lengthy communique, and the transportation of 14 imprisoned FSLN members and themselves to Cuba. The Somoza regime would use this threat against their hegemony to bring down their iron fist. Anatiazo Somoza declared martial law and sent his National Guard to the countryside in an attempt to root out the FSLN. As they combed over the nation, the Guard would commit many hundreds of atrocities, the murder, rape, and torture of peasants in the countryside. These abhorrent acts would not be committed in the dark, however, and detailed reports soon leaked to the international community. Now viewed as a violator of human rights, Somoza and his regime started to feel pressure from the Carter administration. As a result, Somoza called off his National Guard and brought back the free press. Inviting back the free press in 1977 would prove to be a devastating blow to the Somoza regime. With a new free press, the people in Nicaragua were quick to learn on a wide range of topics. They learned how the regime embezzled funds for housing and aid, how the regime made people disappear. More importantly, the people received hope, learning about the activities of the anti Somoza guerrillas. By the end of the year, the regime was on its last legs. By October, the FSLN had ramped up their activities, attacking several National Guard outposts. Before long, even bourgeois groups had started to unite calling for the overthrow of the Somoza regime. The clock was ticking for the Somoza regime, their time ever limited. The death of Pedro Joaquin Camaro. The next step on the path to revolution occurred on January 10, 1978. Pedro Joaquin Camaro, a newspaper editor, would be found dead, riddled with bullets. Presumed to be the work of the Somoza regime, his death would be the straw that broke the camel's back. This one death would be the breaking point of all the building tensions, starting the war for liberation between the Nicaraguan masses and the Somoza regime. In the immediate aftermath of Camaro's death, crowds of the Nicaraguan people burned down government buildings, 
chanting anti-Samosa slogans, and the industrial workers of the nation went on a two-week general strike. In the months that followed, Nicaragua would see successful FSLN attacks on the National Guard, mass demonstrations, labor strikes, and civil uprisings. They will have to kill me first, declared Somoza defiantly, seeing his regime start to crumble. With tensions mounting, the United States proclaimed, from their ivory tower, that the problems the Nicaraguan people were facing could be addressed in the upcoming 1981 elections. Electoralism was incapable of saving the Nicaraguan people, something that was all too apparent for the Nicaraguan people. Not content to wait two entire years for a rigged election, the people formed their own strategy, their own unity. Their broad opposition front, a front of almost all of the major Nicaraguan parties, would call on July 19th for a general strike. Seventy percent of the businesses in the country would comply with this call. To further add insult to the regime, the Carter administration in the U.S. would send a publicly leaked letter to Somoza showing his support for the brutal regime. This would serve to further outrage the Nicaraguan people against the regime seeking to control them. The revolution wins. On July 17, 1979, Anastasio Somoza, with the help of America, fled from Nicaragua. The revolutionaries won. The very next day, a provisional government was declared, and the National Guard surrendered. The new government would ultimately be philosophically guided by Nicaraguan nationalism, Marxist-Leninism, and Catholic humanism, which had also heavily contributed to the revolution. Because the Sandinistas were Marxist-Leninists, both the bourgeoisie of Nicaragua and America feared that they would implement a government very similar to Cuba's. However, the Sandinistas would ultimately implement a very weak government, with them never once turning Nicaragua into a socialist economy or a Soviet-style state due to how deeply religious Nicaragua was and the Soviet Union refusing to promise the new government any protection in case of attack. Irregardless of how weak the Sandinista state was, the American media still gave it the Soviet treatment, using silly buzzwords like totalitarian to describe the new workers' government. The Sandinistas in Power The victory of the Sandinistas ushered in a government truly ruled by the people of Nicaragua, as opposed to the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie that had preceded them under Somoza. Though the Sandinistas would govern through a conservative nine-person directorate, they would manage to radically alter the lives of average Nicaraguans for the better. They opened up 50,000 new primary schools to give education to children in rural areas, increased access to health care for many, regulated food prices to be affordable, set up a literacy campaign in 1980 to educate peasants for the first time, and set up 799 food distribution points all over Nicaragua to ensure that the people were fed. However, with the Sandinistas in power, Nicaragua would also see a resurgence in reactionary sentiments from its bourgeoisie, and a brutal war waged by America which refused to pull its imperialist tentacles off of Nicaragua. In addition, the Sandinistas would implement a mixed economy in which many of Somoza's former holdings were nationalized, political diversity was emphasized, and attempts were made to patch up relations with America by paying off former debts that the Somoza regime had incurred. During the early 80s, the Sandinistas would build up their military strength with the help of aid from the USSR. However, not everything was going well for the Sandinistas. Due to their laxness with the bourgeoisie of Nicaragua, many managed to export their wealth to foreign banks and flee the country with all their money, which hurt the country's financial infrastructure. At the same time, conservative elements of the new government would often get into clashes with the Sandinistas and would utilize the free press, which the Sandinistas allowed, to boost their reactionary messages. Ultimately, with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the new government of Nicaragua was in trouble. Sandinistas at War The bloodthirsty Reagan administration set itself off immediately towards taking down the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. The first few things that it did were cutting much-needed American aid to the country and training up anti-Sandinista forces. Along with that, $19.8 million were funneled into the CIA to train anti-Sandinista forces on Nicaragua's borders. With the American government threatening the post-revolutionary government, the Boer House of Nicaragua began stabbing their fellow countrymen in the back and working with the American embassy. 
As the build-up to war escalated, Nicaragua was forced to import tons of weapons from the USSR and tighten wages for workers in their country. In preparation for the build-up to war, the Sandinistas involuntarily removed thousands of Native Americans, restricted the free press, and got rid of due process within their judicial system. By 1982, full war had broken out as U.S.-backed Contras flooded the country and the CIA-backed Contras worked tirelessly to destroy the country's vital resources and social services, like destroying oil storage facilities and trade harbors, kidnapping and killing doctors and teachers, along with targeting clinics, daycare centers, and grain storage facilities. Ultimately, this military and economic strangulation would bleed Nicaragua of $9 billion in total and a whopping inflation rate of 33,602%. America also managed to isolate Nicaragua economically, absolutely crushing its economy and forcing the Sandinistas to rely on the USSR even more for vital resources like oil and AKs. As a result of the waning economy, wages for most workers fell. While America expected support for the Sandinistas to fall because of these problems, the exact opposite happened. As grassroots enrollment into the FSLN swelled to almost 300,000, and half of all Nicaraguans above the age of 16 were part of the FSLN. In 1982, the FSLN decentralized its government, and in 1984, it implemented multi-party elections. Though these elections were painted as authoritarian and rigged in U.S. media and by the Reagan administration, it saw a 75% voter turnout, with Daniel Ortega of the FSLN winning the presidency. The American media and the Reagan administration would also push out the false myth that Soviet fighter jets were en route to Nicaragua. The following year, all relations between the two countries had broken down as America put a total embargo on Nicaragua. Goodbye, FSLN. Due to the Sandinistas finding themselves in an ever-increasingly bad situation, they were forced to implement austerity measures in 1989 in order to preserve their economy during siege warfare. This especially included cutting thousands of government jobs. In addition, due to increasingly diminishing resources and social programs, many Nicaraguan families were forced to look out for themselves and stop participating in grassroots FSLM programs, especially during the late 80s. By 1990, the Contra warfare against Nicaragua had killed about 30,000 Nicaraguans, representing about 0.9% of the total population. As American warfare against the country showed no signs of slowing down, many Nicaraguans became convinced that in order to get America off their country's back, they'd have to vote out the FSLN. As the next election came up, America funneled millions of dollars into UNO, a conservative and Catholic U.S.-backed party that saw the Sandinistas as demonic with America promising that it would end Contra warfare against Nicaragua if they won. Ultimately, the Nicaraguans faced with never-ending and completely destructive warfare went against their own interests and voted in UNO. And though usually after an election in Nicaragua there was a celebration and partying, the streets of Managua were completely silent on election night. Conservatives take the reins. Ultimately, The new radically conservative UNO government would dismantle everything that the Sandinistas had fought for. In addition to this, they would also praise the very U.S.-backed Contras that had killed and raped many, giving them large tracts of farmland for free, and allowing them to hold on to their arms. The Contras continued to fight peasant cooperate farms in Nicaragua throughout Camara's reign, as FSLN armed peasants attempted to defend them. As Daniel Ortega continued to lead the FSLN, many members would feel betrayed by him as he turned towards appeasing and trying to work with the Camaro government. Post-FSLN Era After their loss in their war against America, the FSLN would become less of a guerrilla organization and much more geared towards electoralism. Along with that, many of Nicaragua's crippling debts would be resolved by various nations. Of course, The class struggle has still continued, with several protests happening against the Nicaraguan government from the angry masses. Daniel Ortega himself has gone on to winning the presidency of Nicaragua multiple times under the FSLN party, with him still in power as of the making of this video.